Okay, just a couple of housekeeping things um, to start off with. There are some seats up here in the front, so if people are coming in, they need a seat, you're welcome to come up here. Also, we're going to have some time for questions within the time of the presentation and um, at the end as well. If you want to ask a question, please come to the microphone here because then people who are listening in or watching the video later can hear your question. And as you um, ask a question, please state your name and um, I guess what your major is. Is that what we usually do? Okay. All right, well, it is truly a pleasure to welcome Cornelius Thomas today um, here to the Kennedy Center. Dr. Cornelius Thomas was born in Cape Town, South Africa, where he was also involved in, um, when he grew up in, in anti-apartheid activities as a student at the University of the Western Cape. And if you want to see, I was looking this morning in one of his books, if you want to see the picture of a disaffected young student, um, you should come up and talk to me afterwards, I thought. <laughs> All right, there he is. You can see he's very passionate then. Um, he later earned his PhD in history from the University of Notre Dame de Lac, and he's worked in South Africa as a historian, professor, archivist, journalist, editor, publisher, and bookseller. He was the director of the Liberation Archives and associate professor of history at the University of Fort Hare, and is now the head of the Cory Library for Historical Research at Rhodes University in Grahamstown. Um, he has published a number of books and articles, and I'm just going to read a few of his books. Cocktails of Liberty, Contours of a South African Student Uprising in 1976, Tangling the Lion's Tell, uh, uh, Donald Card uh, from Apartheid Era Cop to Crusader for Justice, Finding Freedom in the Bush of Books, The UWC Experience and Spirit, and Dust in My Coffee, A Family Called North End Remembers, which he published with his wife, Kathy. Um, you can see he's got a knack for coming up with great titles. He's a wonderful writer. Um, Cornelius and Kathy are also very special to BYU because they housed BYU study abroad students for a number of years when they lived in East London, South Africa. Kathy worked as a social worker and is now an educator um, in Grahamstown. And they both are people of faith, humor, and intellect. I could sit in their house and talk for hours. I've enjoyed my, uh, my times there, and I know they provided a very warm home and wonderful experiences for many BYU students, along with their children, Marcus, Angela, Jethro, and Zia. So join me in welcoming them here today. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Leslie, for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, um, it's really a privilege to be here, um, something that I've looked forward for quite some time now, and to uh, be at the home of so many students who uh, joined us in South Africa. McCray is here today. Uh, I think maybe Heather is somewhere. She said she would be here, uh, and then also the Anna, and so on. So thank you for that, uh, Leslie. Um, thank you to Brigham Young University also, and especially the Kennedy Center for um, uh, uh, providing me with this um, opportunity. Thank you, uh, Stan Benfell, for in, uh, for, for, for in particular uh, uh, for this opportunity here. Uh, uh, then there are other people on Wendy's team uh, who also um, helped uh, me and Kathy come this way, uh, including Wendy Baumgartner, who arranged our, our, our travel uh, itinerary. So um, when uh, Leslie contacted me about uh, this topic, social justice, I said, oh boy, <laughs> this is a very messy topic. But I try to, to sanitize a little bit uh, so as to make sense, and I hope that um, uh, I will make sense. Uh, it's titled Marxists on the March, the Face of Social Justice in South Africa, uh, over two generations, really. Now, by introduction, I'd like to say that, you know, um, the Italian Catholic scholar Luigi Tapparelli was the one who coined the phrase social justice immediately after the 1848 uh, revolutions in, the, in, in, in Europe. Uh, at that time, the church decided to inject itself, to insert itself into public life and to um, 
entrust to Teparelli um, issues of social justice, and he, as a scholar, did research. And he found, and he viewed society as made up of various sub-societies, and within the sub-societies, various individuals. For Teparelli, the sub-societies all had responsibilities and rights. And the individuals in the sub-societies all had responsibilities and rights. All levels of society were supposed to cooperate rationally, according to Tapparelli, to obviate conflict and competition. That was the, the advent of uh, social, social justice. But since then, we've come a long way. And there are various interpretations, definitions of social justice, and we um, find ourselves dealing and grappling with these uh, interpretations and definitions of social justice today. Uh, it means social justice, whatever the social justice activist says it means. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is a concept of fair and just relations between individuals and society. Or it could be the, the exercise of res redistribution by a government on behalf of those who have not by taking from those who do have. Mostly, it is in the latter meaning that I want to unfold social justice. But first, a bit of an ideological background. Now, I'm, ah, very good, we're moving forward. Uh, to start out, I want you to uh, draw a, draw a virt virtual line down the middle of South Africa, a mental virtual line, and there you taper off to down the Fish River. And we'll get to why that is important a little later on towards the end of the lecture. Ideologically, there were certain formations in South Africa uh, starting in 1910 or 1912, rather, the ANC uh, wanting a multinational social democracy, the non-European movement wanting a socialist state, uh, the PAC wanting African socialism, not sure what uh, that's supposed to mean, the black consciousness movement where I come in wanting uh, solidar black solidarity uh, in order to achieve liberation. Then there was a broader student movement uh, with equal rights and opportunity on their mind. Um, and the book that Leslie held up, um, Cocktail's Liberty, is uh, one of the tracks uh, looking at uh, a student movement trying to achieve opportunity and rights. So the 1970s was really my generation. We had five demands. Number one, the overthrow of apartheid. That was foremost on our minds and nothing else really mattered. Part of that is number two, equal political rights. Number three, equal opportunity. Number four, self-reliance. And number five, upliftment of the community. That was code for socialism. So all these formations had a dash of socialism in their program. So for the first 50 years, uh, 1910 to 1960, uh, it was the ANC that was in the vanguard of the struggle from um, the 1970s to the end of the 1980s. It was the broader student movement in the vanguard of the struggle. And then things started to happen, as you know. Uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, released in 1990 and um, so the ANC was sort of recognized as um, the premier or the foremost liberation movement in South Africa. Um, these were the political formations I talked about. The, I'll, I'll go back to that one. The ANC based their whole philosophy on the Freedom Charter. Now, if you look at the Freedom Charter, you will see it's quite a bit of a socialist document that promises good things to the people. 
And these good things, according to the ANC, would be free, gratis, and for nothing. The Freedom Charter promised, especially in text, that education shall be free and that medical care would be free. Nothing else would be free, uh, even though um, uh, 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 a lot of socialist good things are being promised there. So in 1990, the ANC could not immediately implement this particular program because there were other parties involved and the other parties um, uh, wanted to negotiate a settlement. And the settlement was negoti negotiated between 1990 in 1994, when Nelson Mandela was elected president, I voted in Chicago, so did my wife Kathy. It was a wonderful time of, time of hope. And we hoped for a rainbow nation that would um, go forward in harmony. Part of that process of uh, the rainbow nation was um, adopting a constitution which today is considered the most liberal constitution in the world. I think um, we were the first country to uh, legitimize, legalize, constitutionalize marriage between men. A very liberal constitution. It's a small book, uh, but it's a very important book. Now, what the constitution uh, promises are not as much as the Freedom Charter promises or promised. But the Constitution hides its socialism in the phrase, and it, can, it uh, occurs uh, regularly, that the state must progressively provide within its available sources. Progressively provide within its available sources. Now remember the two things that was promised for free in the subtext of the Freedom Charter were education and med medical care only. So that's the transitional period. So we had the ANC in the vanguard, the student movement, and then 1990 to 1996, Nelson Mandela released the, um, uh, the first election and then also uh, the constitution. So everything was hunky-dory, and we plunged into a rainbow nation. But um, soon, uh, what emerged is that socialism that was hidden in those phrases in the Freedom Charter and into, in the Constitution was not only for the poor. There's a such, such a thing as socialism for the rich. So what happened in South Africa from 1994 onwards is the enrichment of the new power elite. The enrichment of the new power elite, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. Massive salaries, housing, housing subsidies for people who didn't need it, like myself, car allowances, air travel allowances, expense accounts, free accommodation, free food, and so on and so on. So we have that as a beginning of the socialist revolution, socialism for the rich. Part of the socialism for the rich was the greatest transfer of, transfer of wealth or money in South African history. The first means of transferring this money was to create a huge parliament. We have 490 members of parliament you have 535, I think. You have a massive country, a massive economy, and so on, and we have a tiny economy. Our economy is about the equivalent of Minnesota. We have 55 people. Minnesota has 5.5 million. So what, Minas what, what one Minnesotan, I don't know if there's such a word, produces, <laughs> it takes 10 South Africans to produce. But the point I want to make is that our parliament, even though our gross domestic product is as small as Minnesota's, our parliament is almost as big as the parliament of the Congress of the United States. In the past, we had four provincial administrations. Now we have nine provincial administrations with legislature, 
bureaucracy, parastatals, and so on, and all of them are paid. We, did, we don't vote for traditional leaders, but we as taxpayers pay the traditional leaders handsomely. And uh, uh, in 2016, for instance, uh, part of the uh, benefits was to each of, the, each of the Zulu king's wives, <laughs> six of them, received a Mercedes Benz worth one million rand. The Zulu king himself has a million rand salary per year. So in the past also we had city councils uh, 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 working for free as a civic duty. Today all city council members and mayors get paid. Mayors routinely get paid more than a million rand a month, sorry not a month, a year, and some mayors get paid more than the president of South Africa. For instance the mayor of Cape Town, the mayor of Johannesburg, and the mayor of Durban. So what was given as a civic duty, is now being paid for by the um, taxpayer. What about the poor? Yes, we did have a um, program for the poor. Um, we called it the Reconstruction and Development Program. We basically took it from your reconstruction program uh, past, uh, after the, um, the Civil War. But we were uh, more generous and more gracious because we were many poor people. And one of the things we gave the poor were, were, was housing and uh, for free. Uh, and this is what we gave them, uh, 40 square meter houses uh, and um, for free. And people who rented their council or project housing, they were given title deed to their housing. So that was a fantastic thing that the poor got free housing and people who rented in the past now could own title deed to their houses. Uh, and so that, that, that was really, really good. Uh, except these houses were not very uh, good quality and people uh, neglected them and some rented them out and moved back to their shacks in the, in the shanty towns and so on. So it was quite a bit of a mess there and so on. But this is one of the instances of social justice or uh, 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 providing for the poor. We also decided on free education. Now remember, free education was mentioned in the Freedom Charter. And um, we then um, provided, as far as we could, made progressively available free education. But we have three uh, schooling uh, grades. Private schools, if you can afford it. No fee schools, those are government schools where the government pays for everything. And Model C schools where um, the uh, government pays only the teacher's salaries. Now what happened here was a great migration from black African schools to Model C schools. Private schools were but maybe a bit too expensive. And the result was that with this great migration was that the Model C schools, the school the government paid only the salaries, became inundated by uh, black students and uh, the schools in the township started running empty. And obviously the poorer kids remained behind in the township schools and so on. So now what to do? Free access to education, yes, but now we have to uh, provide for them. And this is how we provided for them in the interest of equality. No child could be held back. In each phase, there are four phases in our school system. Foundation, intermediate, senior, and further education and training. In each uh, stage, you could be held back only once. Then you had to be moved on. So it could be that after 16 years in school, you eventually pass uh, what we call matric grade 12, and you get your high school diploma. But if you failed four times in the course of high school, you may have gotten your education free, but the 
diploma might be worth nothing, okay? So now, if you spend 16 years at school, you graduate high school at the age of 22, and you get to university, and at university we then say, okay, maybe they weren't so well prepared for university, therefore we will stretch our degree from three years to four years. And uh, we call it extended studies. And then we, the, the university also said that, uh, not the university, Department of Higher Education, it's, it is acceptable for a student to uh, finish a three-year degree in six years. And for these university education, we, the taxpayer, obviously pay. So if you look at six years after high school, it's possible that the, a, a student would, would pass with his degree at the age of 28. So that's a problem. That brings us to our throughput rate. Throughput means how many students do we graduate on time? The best university in South Africa's uh, uh, throughput rate is 37%. That means of every 100 students we get, we graduate 37 on time. Best, the, the others, well, what is that, 63, they will probably go on to complete in four, five, six years. And the average of, of the, our throughput rate in South Africa is 15%. Now, so 85%, they study longer or they drop out. Taxpayer pays for that through free bursaries called, we managed to get fees to fall, so we started giving bursaries, and we used the National Financial Aid Scheme, and uh, at university now we have a new culture emerging, everything must fall. And I'm going to spend two minutes on this, then I'm going to pause for questions. Uh, everything must fall means the curriculum must be changed, fees must fall, as you saw here. Uh, and uh, everything Eurocentric, patriarchal, must be replaced by free, decolonial, Afrocentric, socialist, intersectional, education, and so on. And part of that is uh, the treasures of the university, well, you know, because they're colonial, because they are produced by Europeans or whites, uh, must fall too. So that doesn't sound like social justice, but the fallists, we call them the fallists, um, want, want everything to fall. Of course, now we have in a situation that uh, people are scared of these four lists, and uh, discourse is being stifled on campus. And I think it's the case in, South, in, in the United States also, even though maybe not so uh, bad as in South Africa. One of the new social justice images that, or not images, uh, matters that uh, arose is the rape culture at universities. And uh, the rape culture purports, intimates, says that there's a rape culture at this university and at that university and so on and so on. At our own university, just one example, there was a reference list going around on social media it went viral. I don't know what that means, but it went viral that 11 young men were accused of, of having raped someone. Two of them were kidnapped. They were held overnight in one of our, our dorms and so on. The university investigated, the police investigated. In the end, there were only two cases. One was um, reported and a case was opened, but it was thrown out for lack of evidence, and the other case was withdrawn so much for rape culture at the Uni Rhodes University. But the rape culture was said to be real, and so massive protests uh, rocked the university and so on. And um, of course, the, um, the university responded and uh, gave in to uh, creating special bodies on campus 
to uh, sensitize people and, and so on. Now when it comes to, and I know it's more than two minutes, when it comes to students graduating, what do you do? Well, there's another socialist instrument for this, employment equity. There's actually a law, the Employment Equity Act, which says, and I'll come to that now. Now, let, let me do it, and then we'll have a few questions, and then, yeah. Employment Equi Equity Act says the workplace must reflect the demographics of the population. And the population, I don't know if I have it on here. I don't. It's African 78%, uh, white, 9.5% colors. I, I, I'm, I'm a colored. I'm a capital C colored. Don't ask me, yeah, you can ask me what that is. 8.5% <laughs> Asian or Indian, 2.5% and others, 1.5%. So in other words, according to this act, a university must reflect that composition. Whether the white person has better qualified or not does not matter. And this is the sequence of hiring according to the Employment Equity Act to achieve a reflection of the demographics of the country. African, male, African female first, African male, colored female, Indian female, Indian male, white male, colored male number seven, white male, sorry, white female number six, Colored male, number seven, that's me. Uh, white male, number nine. And foreigner, that's you, uh, no, last, okay? So under this hiring pattern of the Employment Equity Act, it is no wonder that in the new South Africa, only whites, especially white males, and coloreds became poorer. Not me, I got richer. You can ask me about that. So. <laughs> So this is one of, you can see it starts at school and we provide a free education and nobody's held back and eventually you graduate after six years and then we give you a job according to the Employment Equity Act and then the country starts falling apart. Um, or government departments at least and every uh, municipalities and so on. I have two, three more points but I'm going to pause there for questions. And I'm very nervous, so I always have a, an answer for questions. Sometimes my answer is I don't know. <laughs> but uh, a few questions, yes. Yes. Oh, you have to come here, I believe. And, and you can line up here for your questions. Let's take four for now, and then we're going to take it from there. Okay, yeah? Hi, Dr. Thomas. I had a comment. A lot of the students here, with the way the university works, is that they can go to university and work. And of course, it's different in South Africa. You're there full time as a student. So that, that might need clarifying. And the other thing is, um, if you could clarify what you mean by socialism. There's a politician here who says he's a socialist, but he's not. He's saying, what is for the greater good? Whereas I think yours is, um, hinting at an era much earlier than that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean-Pierre Van Tonder, and um, I'm a Latin American studies major. Yeah. Um, and I am from South Africa, as I told you earlier, um, and I lived during the apartheid time. Um, when I was there, we moved in 89 back to, to France. Um, so my question is, do you think that the fact that um, things went too fast in the uh, after apartheid time, and that is one of the reasons why these things have gone maybe not the best way, and so because people want to reverse completely everything that they'd experienced before, um, do you think that's maybe one of the reasons, it, it, maybe there wasn't enough study, maybe there wasn't enough preparation for it, and just wanted to reverse and everything? My name is Dilana Valverde. I'm pre-nursing. Um, and so you talked a lot about like education and how that was affected by socialism, but I was just wondering how this, um, all these changes have affected like medical services in the country and um, like the impact that has had on people. Okay. 
One more. Hi, my name is Maddie Todd. I'm a sociology major. Um, and I'm just wondering if this um, Employment Equity Act, as it was meant to help graduation rates, if that actually did help improve them. Okay. Um, in the South African context, we, um, we do also have um, a system where we um, provide on-campus employment for students. But since 2015, with the Fees Must Fall movement, um, we uh, were under great pressure, whereas before we provided um, um, work opportunity and some assistance here and there. When the Fees Must Fall uh, movement succeeded, um, we um, had to cut our contribution to the, uh, the university's contributions to the students' education because now the government was giving everything, okay? So that's the part of the, so what, one of the things we did was we, we cut our student employment by 50%. We have less money, therefore we can hire fewer students. That was it. Also, because of the, the protests were quite violent at times, we upgraded our security, therefore, uh, there was less money for students. Um, socialism, in my understanding, is one, wanting to make everything equal. And two, using power to take from the haves to give to the have-nots in an attempt to make everything equal. So, um, there is such a thing as socialism by taxation. So uh, socialism for me doesn't necessarily mean, well, the government must own and the government must control, but the government, for me, it means taxing so that you can give to the poor to make the field more level. I'll give you an example of taxation. I pay 25% tax. Thereafter, uh, after a certain level, I pay 37% tax. I pay 15% uh, value-added tax, that's whenever I buy something. And when I, re when I wind up my estate, I will have to pay 20% estate tax. So in the end, I'll pay something like 70% tax. That was my money, it was taken away and was given to someone else. That's the kind of socialism I'm talking about here. Because socialism really is the power to take and re redistribute in a manner that seems it's okay. But I'm not sure it is okay. Because if you tax someone up to the level of 80%, 80% there's a problem somewhere. And in any case, um, history has taught us that socialism through taxation doesn't work. In the end, it collapses and things fall apart. Zimbabwe? Soviet Union, Venezuela, and uh, we can go to other countries also. Medical services, uh, we have a bit of a problem there. Um, you know, when the government controls something, the government uh, also controls the pay levels, uh, the hours, uh, the working conditions, and so on. And if the government doesn't have the money to progressively make available free, edu uh, free medical care, then the government will just say, you will just have to uh, attend to your caseload of 80 patients per day. Uh, we have a, a, a hospital in East London, East London, South Africa. It's a free hospital, it's a massive hospital. There's one neurosurgeon there, and he must take care of all the cases that come to this particular hospital from all over the, the province. Because government said, well, we don't have money for seven new neurosurgeons, so one will have to do. So our, our medical care is not in the best state. The government is now trying to nationalize medi medical care through the National Health Insurance Program. It's at the start of 
of things and, and so on. So, but we'll see how that's going to go. Um, as is the case with private schools, so too with private hospitals, that they pro provide the best care because government is not involved. Wherever government is involved, things fall apart. So EE came, helped the graduation rate. Now, I, I, I think EE was brought about because of the low graduation rate and because if there is not an instrument in place to help those poor, poor graduates, a poorly, gra poorly prepared graduates, they won't get jobs. If they must compete, there's no way they're going to get jobs. That's why the African female, African male, and so on and so on, uh, are helped with this socialist instrument. Um, in fact, if anything, uh, providing more funding for education and stating clearly in the public domain that six years to complete a three-year degree is acceptable, encourage that behavior. And so we have students studying at university, three-year study and three years booze, banter, and protest. B, B, P, yeah. So three years studying, three years booze, banter, and, 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 and protest. If I may continue with three massive items, it's uh, welfare, minimum wages, and land. Three minutes each. And I was so nervous. I was supposed to do something at the beginning of my talk. I forgot. <laughs> Stan, I'll, I'll rectify that. Um, yeah. We have 27% unemployment in South Africa. That's massive. 27% unemployment. No wonder we have a welfare, 17.5 uh, million people on welfare. And so we provide them with welfare checks. Does it help? No, it doesn't help. Because you can only qualify for your welfare check while you're not employed. So people remain employed. A young man employ, uh, being unemployed, how is he going to get money? He can sponge off his family, he can go into crime, or he can impregnate a young woman. How does that work? Because the woman is going to get a grant, and he's going to get some of that money. And if he wants more, then he impregnates his girlfriend again. Now she gets two child grants. And if she wants more, she drinks alcohol during her pregnancy to produce a fetal alcohol syndrome child. And then she gets a bigger child, child, child grant. So we have a... a, a, a um, a situation where 7.5 million South Africans pay welfare to 17.5 million uh, da -da, da -da. Oh, it, it was there. Okay. This is where we now. I made a study of this community in Port Elizabeth, Helen Vale. Uh, this is a colored community, and this is what welfare produces. In 2001, there were 14,600 residents in Helen Vale. Most of them were poor, therefore, they were put on welfare. In um, 2018, there are 30,000 people in this triangle. So in 17 years, the population more than doubled. Why? Because welfare was given and encouraged so that the young women would get more children. So now we have the same number of houses, 22,700 units of houses that used to house 14,600, now houses 30,000. And most of them get welfare. They get dependent on welfare, incentive is lost, and they become permanently uh, dependent on wealthy. And that is what I call um, wealthy slavery, because it's permanent. You are young. I'm not going to last for 18 years. But check in 18 years again. 
and you're going to see the statistic for Helen Vale is 60,000 people in the same triangle of 2,700 units, and you're going to find that the uh, welfare payment to that community will also have doubled. I won't be able to check that because I won't be here, so uh, watch that space. Now, one way to encourage more welfare, because you, if you dispense welfare, you get votes, is to encourage people to go to the, the land of milk and honey. And the land of milk and honey is Cape Town in South Africa. It is the most beautiful province, the most beautiful city with the most horrendous social problems. So what the ANC does is encourage people to migrate to Cape Town to find jobs there. But guess what? There are no jobs there. Anybody could tell them. But they believe they're going to get jobs, and when they're there, they have to apply for welfare. And this is a welfare line in Cape Town. This is the scene every month. Thousands and thousands of people unable to get jobs, forced, therefore, to take welfare, kept on welfare, and kept permanently on welfare, and therefore becoming slaves. There are other instruments also, da, 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 and so on and so on, but I want to talk about minimum wages for one minute. One minute, stop me if I go over one minute. In November last year, the government announced that there would be minimum wage legislation. The, the bill would go to Parliament in May. In the first two quarters of 2018 this year, 45,000 domestic workers lost their jobs. Now guess what? People said, if I'm going to be, this is socialism, socialism is force. If I am going to be forced to pay a minimum wage to a domestic worker, then I'd rather do the work myself, or I'll ask my child to do it. And so 45,000 people lost their jobs in the first two quarters of 2018. Now, if we take the mythical South African family of five members per family, that's a quarter of a million people, almost a quarter of a million people without income. Socialism, through the minimum wage, can only end up in disaster because it legislates the poor out of jobs. Give me another, I'll give you another example. If I uh, hire a gardener for 32 hours a month, I must appoint him permanently. I must have a payroll deduction, a tax deduction, uh, unemployment insurance fund uh, contribution that I must send to the government, and I can't fire this person. So I just don't hire him, and people get poorer that way. Last one. Now remember the first uh, slide? Uh, the first slide re refers to, uh, to uh, the whole of South Africa, and the narrative now is that all of South Africa was stolen by the white man who came from Europe, and uh, therefore all the land must be given back to the African but if you remember that virtual line that you drew down there, and to the left of the line there were no Africans, so, but they still claim all the land. And to the right of the, li the line there were Africans. Now we had a process before, land restitution, and 93% of the people who won their land restitution cases said, no, we want money. We don't want the land, the farms, we want money. So who, pay who paid them the money? The taxpayer, who had nothing to do with this, the government said, yes, you can have the land. You've won your case. You've proved that you've occupied this land or you own this land. But they said, no, we don't want the, the land. So we have a problem there. Now, because land restitution failed, the government sits with 4,000 farms that nobody wants. Why? Because they want money. OK. Kagulin Quinty says, says, said the government bought land and handed it over to aspirant farmers who then sold it again, in many cases, instances, back to the original owner. 
So the problem really is what to do. Now, I'm, I'm going to wrap up by saying something very strange. Jesus and Karl Marx and Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault and Marc Herbert Marcuse and Thomas Piketty and um, Hank Reardon, they were all right. They were all right because they said, you'll always have the poor with you. If you take Thomas Piketty, cap uh, capitalism in the 20th century, he said, the rate of return will always be higher than, than, than economic growth. That means the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer, or they will get relatively poorer. Jesus said, the, po the, 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 the poor you'll always have with you. Um, Pareto said, Wilfredo Pareto said, the 20%, uh, the, the, the print, the 20%, the, the 80% principle will always work. The 20% will always produce 80% of whatever is produced, which means you always have the poor with you. Jesus was right. But now we have the struggle of socialism being imposed from the top and, uh, and uh, people uh, resisting that socialism. Let me stop there because we are really out of time. Um, and let me field another uh, few questions. Yes, thank you. Okay. Let me just say, um, we know some of you will have to go to class. That's fine. Those who would like to stay, please do so. And again, to ask a question, line up here. I was so nervous at the beginning of this uh, presentation, I forgot to present the Kennedy Center with a copy of my book, Cocktails of Liberty. Cocktails, a, a cocktail of liberty is a Molotov cocktail. It's a petrol bomb. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And then I also have a copy of the book, Rhodes University, my university. Uh, I didn't write this one. The university historian wrote it. There's also a copy for the Kennedy Center. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, now, those who have to go have to go, but the others, now we're going to have fun. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dylan Bryan. I'm studying mechanical engineering here. Thanks for your um, discussion today. I was curious, what's the motivation like for people to change the system as it is when they see these policies that don't work? And then also, are there mechanisms in government right now to change it, or does it need a total overhaul for, for things to change? Okay, yes. Second one. Hi, my name is Phoebe Thomas. I'm studying sociology. Um, and I was wondering, it said when you're talking about the fallists, um, they wanted to get rid of like kind of white and Western culture in South America, or South Africa, South Africa. sorry. <laughs> um, but they also supported socialism. Um, and I was wondering why that is, if it seems like it's causing a lot of problems with poverty and welfare in the country. Okay. Hi, I'm Eliza Jackson, I'm studying public health. And I was just curious, um, we talk a lot about like government's implement in implementation with welfare. Um, how do like religious, whether it's churches or other people that contribute to the welfare uh, or money or aid in that sense um, versus the government in South Africa. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Anthony Rucker, and I was wondering because you mentioned the five demands that your generation had in like the 1970s, and one of them was self reliance. So, how did that generation see themselves as dependent before, and maybe what are some of the aspects of that that they accomplished? Or did, because I found it kind of ironic that that was one of the demands, and now maybe the the, the population is more dependent than they've ever been on, on their own government. So maybe just how did you recognize yourselves as dependent before, and if you accomplished that goal of becoming self-reliant? Um, my name is Rebecca Manning, and I'm an international relations major. And I was just wondering, 
you've talked a lot about the efforts to um, progress socialism and a lot of the efforts to keep it going today even, but I was wondering if there's any efforts kind of going against socialism, any groups that are recognizing these issues and what they're doing to rectify that. Yes, thank you for those questions. Um, the first question is uh, whether there should be an overall of the uh, attempts being made now. And um, I think it's, it, it won't be possible because most people are poor and most people are desperate and the power elite realizes that and they are going to feed that very hungry welfare dependent constituency so that they can be voted into power again. We've had, we have a party, the Democratic Alliance, who um, push for an open opportunity society. They have made tremendous headway against this socialism, this creeping socialism. So much so that the ANC panicked and the ANC now formed an alliance with the Economic Freedom Front, a far left party. And so you have a situation where uh, there is some effort uh, being made against this creeping socialism uh, and the, P, the, 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 the ANC panicked and uh, came up with more socialism. One of the things of socialism is that it is self-reinforcing. If a part of it fail, you just heap another part of socialism on, on top of it. If that fails, you heap another one on top, and so on. And the education system is one example of that. Uh, the kids don't do well at school, nobody's held back. The kids uh, pass matric, give them extended studies at university. Uh, the kids pass university eventually, give them Employment Equity Act. So that is socialism being reinforcing. And the end is you'll have socialism, but you will have, of course, a, a response to that. The fallers and their support for socialism. Remember, socialism is also uh, another phrase for socialism is something for nothing. It's very unhealthy. So the fallers want something for nothing. They want Western education to fall. They want the patriarchy to fall. They want white supremacy to fall and so on. And they want that replaced with everybody is equal. Whether it is through affirmative action, black economic empowerment, or through employment equity. So um, for the fallers, uh, welfare grants is fine because in their minds it will facilitate equality. It won't. The other questions about welfare and religion. Now, the greatest person ever lived was Jesus Christ. He was smart. He didn't go to university, but he knew the poor you'll always have with you. He also said, you can take care of the poor anytime. But let this woman do this, this nice thing for me. I can't remember the detail of the... But he said, the poor you will have always with you. You can take care of the poor anytime. That's Christian charity. Now, the difference between Christian charity and socialist charity or social, so, social welfare or socialist welfare is Christian charity is voluntary. You put your hand in your pocket and you give to the St. Vincent de Paul Society. You put your hand in your pocket and you give your tithe to the church. It's voluntary. That's Christian socialism, and that's fine. When Brigham Young came here, he talked about, um, let me see, cooperative, no, so, what, what did he say? Social cooperation. Not social welfare, but social cooperation, meaning you must cooperate, and it's basically what, uh, what uh, Taparelli said, that you have responsibilities in this community and you must acquit yourself of your responsibilities and then you get rights. So if we want 
a measure of welfare and socialism, it must be voluntary. Give to St. Vincent de Paul Society. Give to your neighbor. Not lend, because then it's no good. Then you s spoil the relations. Um, the demand, the five demands, uh, one of them uh, for our generation was to be self-reliant. And um, uh, the gentleman uh, interpreted that, uh, that our generation was dependent. Um, it was more like we were not allowed to be self-reliant, that we were not allowed to buy a house where we wanted to, that we were not allowed to go to a university of our choice, that we were not allowed to socialize with and so on. So self-reliance is, give us, it works with, um, with number three, equal opportunity. In other words, give us an opportunity and we'll become self-reliant. But if you give me money, I'm not going to become self-reliant because I won't want that check again at the end of the next month. And those cues that I showed you are real. The end of the month, I don't go to the ATM. I stay away for five days because I know the wealthy recipients are all in line. Efforts against socialism um, in South Africa, yes. Uh, there's an organization, uh, Afri Forum, who fights against this uh, expropriation of land without compensation. So there is a, a powerful movement. And I think uh, Afri Forum will take this matter to the UN because property is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Clause 17. So I think that case of expropriation land without compensation will go to the United Nations. Also, I think there will be a bit of civil disobedience. People won't, won't just give up their farms and their houses. Um, I am in a fortunate position in South Africa that I own 3.64 houses. Now, now remember, now remember, the government is going to tax me 70%, it's taxing me 70% anyway. Am I going to give up my 3.64 houses? No. I'll rather go to Birmingham jail and write a letter. You get the reference. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. <laughs> I'd rather go to Birmingham jail and, and write a letter. Um, so at one level, at the level of uh, Afri Forum, which is a civil rights movement, yes, uh, there is an effort against this uh, 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 intention. At city level, uh, where people are getting paid a million rand a month for doing nothing, and the infrastructure of the city, for instance, Grahamstown, is really falling apart, um, citizens have now formed um, a civic organization. I think it's the Gra Grahamstown Red Residents Association and in certain other pockets of the country also. And they are beginning to withhold their property taxes. So you have that situation that there is a response. I am not yet withholding mine <laughs> um, because I'm scared I'll use it and not have it in reserve for when I need it to pay my property taxes eventually. Um, but yeah, there is some uh, backlash and uh, I think uh, the matter will go to the United Nations eventually. There will also be class action suits. And then one other thing is that um, um, I've got the other one now. Uh, let me just have a look here. Mm. Da, 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 da. Oh yes, one of the most effective tools we had in the late 1980s and early 90s, but mostly in the late 1980s. I was still in, in the country here studying and I became an activist in the divestment campaign. If the Afrikaners, we argued, did not want to give up, uh, give up apartheid, we will encourage the world, especially the United States, to divest from South Africa. We were successful because the apartheid government soon realized that, hey, we are going to be bankrupt. Nobody's going to give us loans, and people are going to uh, withdraw the investment. So they killed over, and that's how the revolution was born. Not because of uh, the armed struggle uh, but because of divestment, the cultural boycott, and the sports boycott, those threw 
elements, those two items together, made the, uh, the apartheid government say, oh, let's, let's talk. And, and so I think there's going to be a bit of that also. That, um, uh, and that is the kind of thing that I would encourage because I encouraged it in, in the 1980s against apartheid, and I will encourage it now, divestment, to obviate the situation of expropriation without compensation. Because that's the ultimate form of, of, of socialism. If you will think back, uh, that's exactly what Stalin did. And when we looked at it, so many millions were dead. That's exactly what Mao Zedong did. Mao Zedong, and when we looked again, so many million were dead. And um, so, um, yeah, that's the, the, the situation that uh, some people will come and say to the international community, ah, because if farms are being expropriated and they fail in two years' time, we will have hunger and starvation and bankruptcy. Because what will happen if our farms fail, our agricultural sector fail? We'll have to import food and rich people like me will be able to afford, but the poor people won't be able to afford it. There will be starvation and hunger. And that's why I will talk about it. Uh, let me just uh, say hello, Heather. That's one of my American daughters. <laughs> okay, she, she has to go get back to work. Okay, that's, uh, oh yes. The question that was not asked is, uh, what, what is a capital C colored? A capital C colored, and that is how I identify myself, is a person who has a genetic background from Asia, Europe, and Africa, but was born in South Africa and had a special culture. We started calling ourselves coloreds with a capital C in the 1870s. People who think that the apartheid government forced us to be identified as colors, they are wrong. The apartheid government just took the term that we had given ourselves and said, you are colored. <laughs> and we said, okay. So I'm a capital C colored because I have slave background and I have a Dutch background and I have a Khoisan background. That's African, huh? Okay, so I'm capital C colored. Okay, 